question. How many people remember the movie called Spartacus? <laughs> it was a big cast, right? <laughs> well, this this is a very this is the biggest cast you're going to see since Spartacus. <laughs> it's called the Brooklyn Reunion. Now, I'm a kid from South Philadelphia. Now, if you're a group from South Philadelphia or Philadelphia, you're either from North Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, or South Philadelphia, okay? These are the areas. But Brooklyn, I don't have to tell you. Anybody here from Brooklyn? Yes. Yeah. How many parts of Brooklyn are there? I mean, a lot of areas, right? Come up here, young lady. Come here for a second. Come here. Come on up, pretty lady. I want you to tell all the people here, was it Bayhead? What, what are all of the places in Brooklyn? Tell everybody. East New York, Sheepshead Bay, Canarsie, right. Bensonhurst. <laughs> uh, so you had how many neighborhoods? Yeah, yeah, ma so, so many, so many. Thank you, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> so there is the difference. There are so many neighborhoods that comprise Brooklyn. And I go back with Teddy Rendaza. I go back with the three friends, the three chuckles. But then this is the early 50s. And then in the middle of the 50s and the end of the 50s, so many great groups, the Passions, the Chimes, the Classics, the Mystics, the Jive Five. We have three of the best that represent Brooklyn. I'm talking about the Classics, okay? I'm talking about the Passions and the Mystics. Would you welcome Emil and all of the other guys from the Brooklyn Reunion? Come on out here. Look at this. Emil, sit, sit, let Emil sit over here. You sit over there. Go ahead. Oh, okay, good. Hey, whatever you want to sit. Now... This is, uh, this is the cast of Spartacus. <laughs> or I could say it's a bocce ball reunion. Wow. All right? <laughs> and four people went home already. So we... <laughs> now, why don't you introduce all the guys? Go ahead. Okay. This guy. Including me. I'm, I, Al, I'm Al Contrera, originally with the Mystics. I sing with the Classics now. You can introduce. Oh. <laughs> Teresa McLean right here, and she sings with the classics. I'm Emil Stuccio from the classics. I'm Michael Paquette from the classics, the mystics, and various other groups. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Albert Gallion. I sing with the Passions. I'm a founder and original member. And how about the guy that's falling asleep next to you? <laughs> He's praying. <laughs> In nomine Patri et Spiritus Sancto, Amen. I'm going to grab you later. Oh, you see what he said at the time that a fanud means I'm in trouble. But all joking aside, uh, my name is Lou Rotondo. Some people call me Richard. Well, that's my original name. Uh, I sing. I sang with many groups. I did. Actually, Mr. Stuccio and myself were the classics. Am I lying? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a stool pigeon you are. Oh, you see, now you can know what corner he hung out when he says stool pigeon. <laughs> now, let, you know, I, I, it boggles my mind, guys, because I said this. Every city was South Philly or West Philly or North Philly or Germantown. Brooklyn is such a wide area. I mean, little it's Anthony, the Imperials. I mean, how do you explain so many groups that came out of Brooklyn. I mean, how do you explain that? We had nothing to do. <laughs> all, all this started when, you know, we were in high school and prior to high school, and some of us went to high school, and some of us during high school decided, you know, we hear Frankie Lyman and the teenagers, we heard all these other groups, and they said, you know, we could do that. You know, we could do that, but you have to get on a street corner and you have to learn how to harmonize and you have to get a couple of people who know who how, how to harmonize. So that's what we did. The learning experience was incredible. 
You know, we would <laughs> remember the days when we first got together and you get a bunch of guys. Now, we, did, we had no formal musical training at all. Barely went to high school at this point. So we says, you know, how are we going to, you know, uh, Frankie Lyman, the teenagers had the, the harp tones, had this, and we listened to their records. So the only way you could learn how to sing this stuff by it's listening by, to the records. By listening to the records over and over and over. You know, and one guy would go, okay, listen, uh, ooh, and you make go, ooh, and you go higher and you go low. Hours, hours and hours and hours. And we're still doing, ooh, and then <laughs> finally, finally, someone hit harmony. And we were like, wow, that's amazing. This is what we're supposed to do took forever. Well, you know, you talk about the <laughs> harmony, and then you talk about the great leads. I mean, Emil, I mean, uh, you, you talk about Lenny Coco. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you talk about Gallagher, Jimmy Gallagher, and all those guys like that. You know, when you were in school, were you all together when you formed, formed the group? Or you got somebody from another school, or you got somebody from up the street? Sure. I, I, th I <laughs> First of all, what, what Al said is, is correct. You know, we, were, we had an interest in the music, but guys like yourself who were really spinning the discs, you know, playing the records, it, it was you, Alan Freed, they, you made it exciting for us. It, and the kids were following your show, following Alan Freed, following uh, you know, Dick Clark. You know, they say, oh, wow, this, this music is really exciting. And then you find a 12-year-old kid singing Why Do Fools Fall in Love, and you know, you say, can we, can we do this? Can we? And then, you know, I'm friends with, well, we're all friends with Vito yeah. McCone. At 16 years old, he writes Little Star, yeah. and you say, well, maybe there's hope, maybe we could do this. And it just developed. I mean, we, I'm sure that you, you probably, oh, those of you who don't know, we all grew up in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn, and uh, what had happened was there were so many guys, so many guys standing on the street corners and are you sing with them tonight or you sing with them tonight mm -hmm. and as it turns out we made a pact that we would look out for each other whenever we had the opportunity if we if one of us got a record deal we'd look out for the other the other groups the yeah, other the rest and, of the guys and, and educate them educate and yeah. so the first guys yeah. to record a song for a guy by the name of Jim Gribble you know you know the stories about Jim Gribble he he was um an agent that represented a lot of different groups, groups. yeah and and what he did was uh he held uh, auditions and the first out of the three groups in the neighborhood the first group to get a record contract were the mystics and the mystics uh, went on to record hushabai in 1959 so wow the neighborhood guys the the mystics they they got a big hit record it's hushabai they brought the passions up to the same age an agent and uh, that same year, 1959, the Passions went on to record one of the prettiest songs that year, Just To Be With You. And again, it charted. And we have two two records out of the neighborhood. And there was one left. And I, I you, you could say it. I, I, you know, he, he was a, a couple of years younger than us. And we would be on the corner. He would be going, can I sing? Can I sing? <laughs> can, let me sing. Please let, let me sing. So we finally said, you know what, let's, let's listen to him. Let's see what he sounds. He was horrible. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. He, I think you're right. He was so, so good. And we said, you know, you got a couple of guys that you sing with? He said, yeah, yeah, I guess he said, we'll take. So Louis from the Passions. Louis. He, he, he took, Luigi. He, he, took them, he took them up to Gribble's, Jim Gribble's office, mm -hmm. and Jim heard them and recorded them. The what? same. This, the next night. The next what, night. What he did, and this is a true story. I, I get a kick. We were, we were in the, the waiting room before Jim was having the auditions, and every group that went in there, I, they were I, amazing. Jerry, I, I swear that every one of them were better than us. I mean, much better than us. They were singing harmonies like the four aces, the four leads. Well, that's interesting because the harmony, very good point. Because in the early 50s, you had the four coins, you had the four lads, you had the four the aces. aces yeah. That was different harmony. Yep. Yeah. You see, you so, guys, right. That was left over from those early early 50s. Right. 
like you mentioned before. Right. It, it was the uh, hit parade, Snooky yes. Lanson. Yes, Snooky Lanson, and the, Dorothy uh, Collins. And the hit Giselle parade. McKenzie. Right. But you see, that's how unique our music was. The harmony they had was not the harmony of our mothers and our fathers with the four races and the four lads and the four lovers and all the stuff like that. It was basically black harmony. It, it yeah. was street harmony. Yeah, That's what it was. yeah. It was but you know, so, so so strange, strangely <laughs> enough, <laughs> strangely enough, after hearing those groups, I said, how are we going to compete with those guys? I'm in the, the waiting room and I'm saying, and I was 16, and, and I said, how are we going to compete with those guys? And then it's okay, uh, classics, come on inside. And we go inside, and Jim <laughs> Jim Gerber was smoking a cigarette. Not this way. He was smoking it like this. Yeah. Uh, you know. A real agent. And his first words, to, I'm not kidding, first words to me was, are those your lashes? I said, my what? <laughs> I said, my eyelashes? He says, hmm. And he had a lady next to him and a, and a gentleman next to her and he said, uh, "Oh, it looks like we got some pretty boys here." Because the, he didn't mean me; he meant the rest of the group. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he said, "Can you sing?" And I gave him a yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, "Yeah." He says, "Do you have anything original?" And we had a record. Co we had a song that we had written. Jimmy uh, Cresser wrote, and um, it was a song called Cinderella. Yes, and, and you, yes. You remember yeah. that? He goes. And, and the words were, uh, it, they were so memorable. It, it was like Unchained Melody. It was, I met this chick at the Saturday dance, <laughs> knew that I would take a chance. So he said. <laughs> and then the bass, the bass said, well, it's 12 o'clock. Now you must go home. <laughs> I said, and he said. Oh, I think we got something. I said, really? <laughs> I, said, I want whatever he's drinking. <laughs> but you, you, I mean, the other side. Oh, yeah, so in love. That's what I played. Yeah. I played so in love. See, My it, love for you. Do that. Go ahead. Beautiful. My love for you. Do, 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 do. It's like a star shining so bright. What words? And very far. <laughs> but that was the song. That spoke for the kid that wanted to dance. Yeah. When the kid didn't know how to say, I, I, I really like it, I would play that song. My love for you. I mean, every one of the songs right. those, those, spoke. Those were lyrics yeah. for teenagers. Yeah. And that's what the teenagers liked. <clears throat> when you mentioned the Shangri-Las and all, I mean, the, the Four uh, Coins Four with Coins Shangri -La. sang Shangri-La. Now, the young teenagers couldn't. They couldn't associate they couldn't with associate right, with right, right. your kisses love <laughs> shangri it, it wasn't it wasn't something they could sing no. what what we wound up doing is something that they could sing and if if you walk through our neighborhood in those 50, 1957 1958 <clears throat> every other corner had a bunch of guys on the street corner under a street lamp <clears throat> singing trying to sing a cappella. And there were people in the windows right above, because this is all tenement houses it's going, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> shut up! <laughs> but you know what's very interesting, Emil? You guys did songs that the Hilltoppers did. Yep. Now, the Hilltoppers were Jimmy Saka. That's right. Okay, till then, and things of those songs. P.S. I Love You. Right. And your harmony was different, even though the arrangement was the same. I mix the Hilltoppers and you with the songs. When, and by the way, I'm not promoting anything, but the CDs downstairs that these guys have and I have, you'll hear the difference when I mix Till Then by the Hilltoppers and, and with you guys. Whose idea was that to take a classic song? You know, we, when we had Cinderella and, and we were traveling on, we were doing these tours, you know, with all the groups and right. You know, Frankie Avalon, Bobby Rytel. And, and we're going from city to city, and there was a guy named, oh, you mentioned the Chimes. Uh, Lenny Coco. Lenny Coco and the Chimes. Uh, their agent at the time was a guy named Andy Leonetti. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Andy. Little label, little label. Yeah, yeah he had tag, uh, music Boy, note. Right, yeah, anyway, he said, uh, he said uh, listen, how long do you have on your contract? And I said, our contract ends in 
six months. Mm -hmm. He says, come to my office afterwards. He says, you're singing the wrong material because he said, you're doing novelty songs, Cinderella. He says, the way you guys are set up, you know, the way we look and the harmonies Harmony. that we have, he said, the I classics. want, exactly. He said, uh, I, have, uh, I have an idea. And it was 1963 and it was right before the Vietnam War. You know, well, I mean, we were teetering on a, a you know, a rough time in the country's uh, life. And uh, he said, I got a song. And he said, but I'm going to set you up with a guy by the name of Larry Lucy, a jazz guitarist. Yep. And, and, and ja Larry comes over and he says, uh, son, come over here. He says to Jamie, the bass singer, he says, I want you to do 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 doom, do do doom, do do doom. And you, son, you go, Till then, I right. said, and and then I said, is that how you want me to sing it? <laughs> Till then, he says yes, and, I, and we we started rehearsing it, and I said, you know what, it's starting to sound good to me. Anyway, <laughs> we went we went in to uh, record the song, and it was the first time in my life that I, I mean, I heard my voice before on recordings, but then it was the first time in my life, not not so much my voice, but. With the recording itself, the song, I said, you know, we might have something here. And that's a, that's interesting because the first time as a group that you go into a professional studio and they play back the first the, playback. the first yeah. recording that you ever did in a professional studio, the sound, the huge speakers. Don't forget, again, I will repeat, but we grew up in Brooklyn. We had a wire tape recorder. <laughs> we didn't even have regular cellophane tape. We had a wire tape recorder. And that's what we used to listen back to. So it's just like, so it's listening to it on an old radio. And it was terrible. So when we finally went into the Record, studio yeah. and they played, um, actually, Hushabai wasn't the first recording no. we did. They asked us to do backgrounds for uh, other, groups. Yeah. Other, other artists other that were stuff. on yeah. the label. But the first time we heard ourselves back, we said, well, we're not so bad. This is, this is <laughs> like, this is we right. Really this good. is show business, man. <laughs> this is really but, good. You know, talking about Hushabai, this great story about Hushabai, it was written by two wonderful writers, Doc Palmas and Mort Schumann. Correct. And Doc Palmas wrote This Magic Moment, wrote so many wonderful songs, both together, Palmas and Schumann. Uh, as a matter of fact, he did... Lonely Street for Ray Charles. Bum, 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 amazing bum, writers. Bum, amazing, amazing writers. And they recorded on a little label, what was it, Otacon? No, Laurie Records. Laurie, Laurie. Laurie. The subsidiary was Otacon. Otacon. And where the passions, the passions were. Right, right, where you guys recorded. Right. But tell them the story about when you recorded and who wanted it. Uh, this is a great story, folks. So... We're up, like I said, we were doing a lot of background uh, songs for other artists on Laurie Records. And, and part of the, the point of it was that Jim Gripple wanted us to get recording experience, you know, mic technique and all this stuff. Well, we didn't understand what they were saying, but we just did it anyway. So we were getting mic technique, we were getting recording experience. And they said, you know, we got a song that we want you to sing. And the first song they gave us, besides doing background songs, was a song called Adam and Eve. And it was good. It was a, it was a great song. We were happy to record anything. I mean, we didn't care what it was. And then they says, you know, we got these two guys who are going to come in and play a song. We didn't know who Doc Palmas and Mort Schumann was. We really did not. But they came in, and they sat on the piano, and they, they were playing... And they they played uh, "Teenager in Love" for us, and ding, 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 they showed us the background, and you know, you guys do this, and why must I be a teenager? Wow, what a song! We said this is fabulous. So we learned the song the same day, the same day. That afternoon, we went home, and we would we didn't drive into the city. We went home, <laughs> we went home on the subway, and on the way home on the subway, we're hanging on the pole, and we're going. Why must I be? And this is awesome. We're gonna be big stars. This is a, this is a hit. We get home the next morning. We get a phone call from Jim Gribble. Is you guys got to come back into the city? Um, well, yeah. Why? He says, well, because um, uh, the president of Lori Records, Gene yeah. Schwartz, he wants to have a conversation with you. We say, well, wow. 
maybe they're going to give us another great song because the first one was so-so. We get into the city, sits us down, and, and Gene Schwartz goes, listen, listen, boys, um, we're, we're a record company and we're in business to make money. And we're starting to hear this and we go, I don't know where this is going. And we're, I mean, I was 19 at the time. You know, what do we know about? So he says, uh, this song, we, we talked about this song. It's so good that we know it's going to be a monster hit. And if we give it to the mystics, it's iffy whether or not you'd have a hit because you have no track record out in, in, the, in the field. But if we give it to Dion and the Belmonts, that would be a big hit. And we that work out. <laughs> Had that work out. <laughs> you know, so I said, this is a true story, folks. Yeah, so we're going, well, um, uh, okay. I mean, we don't have anything to say about this, but he says, and he says, Doc Palmas and Mort Truman are coming up in, a, in about a half hour, and they have another song for you. We says, okay, all right, you know, we're a little disappointed. We're hanging out. They come in the office, and they played Hushabai for us. I says, wow. We, we all looked at each other. Well, this is just as good. Not as good, but this was just as good. At the time, it was, for us, it was like amazing. How could two guys be so talented, the right teenager in love, and go home and overnight, and they actually told us, they wrote it on the way home. Can you imagine this? They wrote it on the way home. And they had a little direction. And uh, uh, This is something a lot of people don't know. Because Gene Schwartz told them, write a song that had a little flavor of Little Star. Exactly. And... It does. You know, when you really think about it, it think does. About it, really? Yeah. Where are you, little yeah. star? Hush a bye, hush a bye. Yeah. It's a nursery nurse rhyme call. type of song. And, and uh, so Vito was, I hate to say it to him, but <laughs> <laughs> no, he was kind of responsible for hush a bye. Yeah. So we recorded hush a bye and, um, and stayed with Adam and Eve on the other, on the, for the B side. And we were thrilled. Thrilled to death. It was just an amazing experience. So. Lori Records. And here's another interesting thing. All of these groups did not record on major labels. If you recall, if you watched the Gary Puckett interview, we talked about the Gary Puckett recorded on Columbia Records, yeah. which had national, international distribution. These guys, who recorded on Dart? <laughs> okay. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who recorded on Lori Little label, independent, Otacon, independent labels. Now, here's something very interesting, guys. In 1952, 53, there was a group called the Five Keys. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Five Keys. I mean, close your eyes. Out the sight. verdict, wisdom of a fool. Out of sight, out of, out of, mind. Sight, out of mind. They were lucky enough to record on Capitol Records. All those hits, and they became hits because of national distribution. And this is interesting. The guy that signed the five keys, his name was Dave Cavanaugh. Same guy that signed Sinatra wow. to Capitol Records back in when Frank needed a, a deal. Amazing. So it's a, but, but imagine breaking through on a little cockamamie label. Yeah. I mean, really. But, but what a lot of people don't know is that... Yeah, like Emil said before, when you went into a record company, there were probably half a dozen groups who were going to record and did record. Not every song that you record becomes a hit. Probably maybe one out of, I, off the top of my head, I said one out of every 3,000 recordings at least gets played on the radio. And the ones that get played on the radio maybe one song becomes a hit. It's, it's extremely rare to have a hit record. And it's like hitting the lottery. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you how lucky you guys were. You did it at the end of 59 to the early 60s. If you would have tried to do it when the English invasion came in, it wouldn't happen. No. And you know why? They couldn't get airplay. Right. Radio with the English invasion, format radio only played 40 records. 
everything after the Beatles, English, English, English. Yeah. So you were fortunate to come in right before exactly. the British invasion. That's how we planned it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many times, so many times uh, we get, you know, people ask for an interview, you know, different radio stations. And uh, Till Then came out in 1963. Right. So uh, one of the questions that is a common question, were you bitter when the English groups came in? And I, and I, this is my real, I, I truly mean this with all my heart. I couldn't be yes. bitter. No, <laughs> no, I couldn't be bitter because I said, I have worked with so many people that are much more talented than me that never had the opportunity to do what we did. So I say, you know, thank God that, you know, we had the opportunity and I'm Before grateful. Before the invasion. Yep, yep. Before and the invasion. Yeah, so yeah. we got a piece of it and I'm, I was happy. But you know, just getting back, and this is not blowing smoke, it was guys like yourself who heard a record and had the ear to say, you know what, this is, this is going to work. Do you know, guys, the love that I have for the music that you guys create, and they have the same love, because the songs you spoke were songs. I never played the Beatles, never. Mm. Because she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to hold. That was bubble gum to me. Yeah. You guys were the real deal back in the day. I mean, you were street kids, yeah. and you had the sound of the street. And no disrespect for the Beatles. I look, look, look what they did. Look what they came. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I, I would have changed places with them. Yeah. <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> hey Caesar, look, look who just came in. Caesar, Caesar, Caesar from one of the, the times, nicest mans on gentlemen. the nicest man on and, the planet. And, and to, talking about luck and talking about DJs, when Hush Your Pie came out, yeah, we didn't know what you what you're saying is really really important because it depended on who would play the record. Yeah. Laurie only had Dion and the Belmonts to go to radio stations and say, you know, we're Laurie Records, we had Dion and Belmonts, and now we got the Mystics. Would you play this song? Whether or not they had time to play, was some, but Alan Freed yep. picked up our record, um, unbeknownst it. to us, and liked it. You know, why? I, I have no idea, but he liked it. And he played it on his uh, radio show, and then he closed his Saturday night TV show with that song every Saturday night for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I, mean, I feel that's how Hush Your became a hit and it started to sell. Interesting thing is that like you guys and all of us, when the record company calls you in and they go, we sold 2,000 records in Hartford, Connecticut. Wow. Where's Hartford, Connecticut? <laughs> oh. We're from Brooklyn. What the hell do we know? You know, so yeah, almost. almost. And then the <laughs> disc jockey wants you out there to do a show, <laughs> right? And now you got to do a record hop in Hartford, Connecticut. And you know, we went out there, and then they, then we would get reports of, oh, you know, Detroit got four thousand. This guy, but and before you know, it, we were selling tons of records, and we had to go get suits. Oh, speaking about suits, speaking about suits, this is a true story. Louis, Louis was talking to me yesterday. He said, when the classics first came out, we, we, we <laughs> he said, he says, they're putting you on tour. The, I got to tell you, a big, big help from the passions. These guys helped me out so much. Really? No, no. They, they, they were crazy, but they were the sweetest guys in the world. And I mean, Nuts. <laughs> they, were, they were crazy. Uh, <laughs> I, I love these guys so much. And, and let, me, let me tell you. So Lou says to me, Louis, Louis says, uh, I said, we're going out on the road. He says, yeah. I says, we don't have jackets. We don't. He says, uh, you know what? We got two sets of clothes. We'll, we'll hold on to these. But we they got were, the. They were the who? They were the passions. Yeah. Oh, the Del Rays. Yeah, 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 the Del Rays. Del Rays. Yeah. So he says, I'll, I'll, we'll lend you our checkered jackets. Do you remember that? It was great. They had the Cabone. <laughs> Cabone. A Cabone. Cabone. <laughs> Cabone. <laughs> I told you they're crazy. <laughs> no, the Cabones are upstairs on the ninth floor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Louie. Listen, Louie, if you want to sing it, you'd be a great racket guy. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> First, the feather flop together. And you know what I'm saying, right? Right, I do know. I love you. 
<laughs> I always loved you. I tell you that, right? <laughs> well, you know why? Because you and I, our careers could have been different. <laughs> All of us. Yeah, all of us. Uh, all of us. From your lips to God's ears. It, 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 Thank that's, God. You know, Al, Al wrote a book, and, and it's uh, The Mystics, The Music, and The Mob. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and if you if you get an opportunity, I'm not plugging the book. But yeah, no, yes, but it's, it's here. No, but you, I you am. Get the book. <laughs> I'm plugging the book. Yeah. It, you but it, get it, the book it, in there here. There you go. It, there you oh, go. You'll there read you. stories in there. And, and yeah. believe me, that is the tip of the iceberg. Some hand bone, hand bone. <laughs> some some things yeah. some things went on. Yeah. You know, Could that, I yeah. say hello, something? Hello. Could I really say something? No. When I read the book, I grew hair. <laughs> and that's no lie. <laughs> I was on pins and needles. It reminds you of a lot of stuff that no, went it, on. It came off anyway. <laughs> Al Alby, you, I'm sure you got something to say. I believe Ain't on the I mic. believe it was more than luck that we all got this way and where we are now. I think it was the Lord above that really helped us. Way to go, Alby. Absolutely. Albie and I go way, you know, I go back with you guys, the Brooklyn Paramount, yeah. yep. the, the New York Paramount. I mean, I, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, it was an, ex now, but just imagine this. You're a kid, 16 and 17 years old, and all of a sudden you're a star. You go back to the neighborhood, the girls are swooning, everybody, wow, we heard your record, <laughs> we saw you on television. <laughs> I mean, I mean how do you <laughs> we, we, after we came, we did the Alan Freed uh, TV show the first time, and then of course after the TV show, we we took the subway, we we went home, and and we and we says we want to do now. We says oh let's go to the diner and get a cup of coffee, and we go in the diner and they're all going yeah. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> who, who, who were they applauding? <laughs> It, it never dawned on us that you know, and, and it still doesn't. You know, you know, you, uh, uh, the expression "pinky ring." You know, uh, the, whenever, whenever, like growing up in Brooklyn, the, there are a lot of crooked noses. You know, a little pinky rings. And <laughs> we, I, I, we were all standing on the corner, and all the guys are going, "Oh, who's that?" And Louis shows up. For, he just did a television show with Clay Cole, and he's got <laughs> makeup on. He said, "What is that?" <laughs> <laughs> You hey. forgot to take the makeup off. You're lucky you didn't no. get a. You're lucky you didn't get a beating. <laughs> what? <laughs> you got three guys following him. Albie, Albie, Albie. Do you, do, Albie, you remember those days though? Yeah, yes. You know, back then, if you were in a corner. You had the grocery store, you had the candy store, you had the, uh, this store, and you had the racket guy on one corner. Oh, yeah. The other corner, you got the kids singing. Right. The other corner, you got the cops. Right. Well, that's part of the thing in, in, the, in the book is that I talk about the first guy that we met be before we went to Lori Records. Some, somebody in the neighborhood says, uh, you, got, you guys are so good, you should go see Frankie Mouth. Frank, <laughs> Frankie Mouth hung out at the 19th hole. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you know that movie, um, oh, God, uh, Bronx it. Tale? You know Bronx yeah. Tale? Where the guy is always standing on the corner. He's got a shark skin suit, and he's always standing on the corner. And you wonder, why is... You know, <laughs> he never moves. You never move. This was Frankie Mouth. He was outside the front 19th hole. And what it was is, you know, people would come by and slip him... Hundred bucks, yeah. and he would be collecting all the money. So anyway, somebody <laughs> says to him, somebody says he was either a loan shark or a number runner. Right, that's right. correct. So <laughs> somebody says you got to go see Frankie Mouth to get into the music <laughs> business, and we we realized at nineteen and twenty years old that the music business had some affiliation with with the mob, Those you know. <laughs> so we went to Frankie Mouth, and he says. Um, well, can you sing? So we, of course, we auditioned for him. Like he, what do we know? We, this is before everything. Uh, and he says, uh, well, I got a friend of mine um, that's in the music business. And, uh, you know, I, I'll bring him down. And he calls this guy up. And he says, you know, this little, you know get down here. <laughs> get, get down here. from the pay phone, by yeah, the way. Get, yeah, right. Get down here now. So this guy comes in and we uh, and we we sang for him and and he we didn't realize he was um, he was a trumpet player for the big band era and he owed Frankie a lot of money because he was a gambler so Frankie says listen 
record these guys. And we went in and we recorded with him in a brinky dink studio on um, in the Ed Sullivan building, 1697 Broadway. 67, yeah. yeah. So we record and the guy, uh, oh, he charged us $500. He says, you got to give us $500. In 1959, we didn't have five hundred dollars. We didn't even. I, I didn't even knew there was a five hundred dollar number. So we says, well, how are we going to pay this guy? So we says, well, we'll go. We'll take a loan. That's what people do. Is that we'll Jake Cigars? Was that Jake Cigars? Remember Jake the Shylock? Yeah, well, it was the same right. thing. Well, we didn't go to the Shylock because we we already went to him. So, so we we says, well, do they know what a Shylock is? You know what a Shylock is? Oh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> It's a guy that, a guy that Say it says, again. What? No. Shakespeare. No. I think no. It, that's, that's a nice way of saying it's close. it. close. A, a loan shark is somebody who lends you money. And how does he yeah. do it? Yeah. How does he do it? Hey, you, come here. Hey, you, come here. He's, he lends you money, and then if, you, if he tells you next week, you got to give me $100, and that's not what you're paying him back. If you borrowed 500 that's the vig. They call the it a vig. vig. Yeah. And the the vig, the vig it, that five hundred dollars. If you think it's gonna go away in a year, you're gonna be paying it when you're sending your kids to college. Email. That five hundred dollars. Yeah. That's why you only borrow ten dollars. Yo, yo guys, this is not the Keith offer investigation. <laughs> yeah. That's so right. let's get back to the record. Right. So, so 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 anyway, so we go we go to the dime savings bank and we go into the lobby and we see this guy is sitting there in a suit, and we go, uh, we'd like to take a loan out. The five of us, you know, like to take a loan out. He goes, "Who are you?" Well, we want to go. Why? Why? Why do you want a loan? He said, "Well, we're going to cut a record, and we're going. We'll pay you back." We'll pay you back as soon as the record becomes a big hit. He's looking at us like we're crazy. He says, "Do you do you have any uh, collateral? Any collateral?" <laughs> so we look at each other. And go, what's collateral? <laughs> oh. I, said, I don't know what collateral. He goes, "Well, you have somebody has to sign for you, or you have to have something worth more." You know, I don't have to explain. You to sign you. your house yeah. over. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so one of the guys in the group, Bobby Ferranti, his. His, Bobby's father was a insurance salesman, so we figured he knew a lot about this stuff, you know. So we go to him, and he says, "I'll sign. Get the papers. I'll sign them." We got the five hundred dollar loan. Let's talk about the record business. Forget. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. So we go in, and we paid for that. The guy in the recording studio, after he recorded us, he says, "That guy that brought you in here, he's not good." He says. How much did he charge you? It's five hundred dollars. He said the session only cost one hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, really? So he says, and you guys are really good. He says that's how we got to meet Jim Gribble. He says, take the elevator. He made a call. Take the elevator up to ten, and I made a call, and you're going to go sing for Jim Gribble. That's how we we, we met him. And from that point forward, it, this is the whole rest of the story. Happens. This is all in the book. Absolutely. So <laughs> you could get the book. Uh, by the way, you get the book in the gift shop, right? Yeah, I think I. Oh, she's oh, got some got books the book. out there. Okay. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay. Oh, right we'll outside. Over there. That's so cool. You and know, um, we, there's also an audio version. I did the audio version. It's really cool. Um, audio, audible dot com and. Uh, one of the questions everybody asks what? is, how and why did you write a book? And the reason, basic reason, is because of Phil, which everybody knows. So Phil, he was on the cruise earlier, <clears throat> but uh, uh, something happened during... I, 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 just in case, I, I, Phil is the original lead singer of the Mystics. Now, yeah, they okay. Just, uh, so... After we recorded Hushabye, which Phil again was the lead singer, and after our second song, which was Don't Take the Stars, we hung out <clears throat> in a gas station that we grew up next to in Brooklyn. And one night... Hmm? Yeah, why? It's in the book. No, I'm going to give up the... <laughs> That's my line. It's in the book. 
<laughs> you're the, she, she says, you, no, you're going to give the story away. It's in the book. <laughs> but it's, it makes the reason why we wrote this whole thing. And, the, and, the, and I say we because everybody had an input. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I was never a writer. I don't know how to write, but somehow it came out good. So, so Phil is in, in the gas station, and a couple of guys that we know from the neighborhood came in to hold up the gas station. It was a common thing, so <laughs> but they had a uh, they had a gun and it was loaded and whether or not they realized it was loaded or not we we don't know. Now the gas station attendant I w I wasn't there I was supposed to meet Phil but I wasn't there thank thank God <clears throat> and the gas station attendant was changing a tire and he had a tire iron in his hand and the uh, these guys come up and they said, this is a holdup, and he, they, he, they startled him. And he, he, he hit the gun, and the gun went off, and it killed the guy, it killed the gas station attendant. That set off a whole chain reaction of stuff that went on and on and on um, to, to the point where the police came and, and the whole thing, and they said to Phil, we, we need to, that, those guys ran away. I mean, they ran away. And they said to Phil, do you know those guys? Now, you can't say, I know them, because those were tough guys. And if you ratted on them, they'd come after you. So you'd have to just say, no, I never saw them before. I don't know who they are. As it turns out, they finally caught up with the guys for other reasons, which is in the book. And then when you see that, um, you know, they said, well, y well, you said you didn't know them. Now all of a sudden they're saying they know you and you know them. So to make, uh, it, it's long in the book, but I'll shorten it up. They all got convicted. Phil was supposed to, uh, because they realized later that he really wasn't involved in the actual robbery, but he was there and at the very uh, end of the whole thing, they all, a, a lot of them got a lot of, did a lot of time because it was murder. But Phil was not involved. But he did two years. They put him away for two years. It wasn't supposed to happen. But at the last minute, they had a change in the judges and the whole thing, and, and he, he went away. So I felt obligated to write this story because over the years, there were always people coming to us, all of us, and saying, did Phil kill those guys, or did Phil kill that guy? And the story went from one guy to he murdered six people. So I felt obligated to tell the real story. So this is the real story. It's in, in the book. And it's in the book. And you can see this on television on the Kefauver investigation <laughs> every afternoon at 3 o'clock. We hit on a lot of points here. Yeah. Going on. But listen. Through it all, these guys, through their God-given talent, have created the music that we love. So, ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for the classics, for the passions, and for the mystics. Thank you. Right? Thank you very much. And Thank you. Thank you for being here. And remember, really, the book is at the... And you can get my book. My book's a little different. <laughs> Not too much different. <laughs> it's very, very similar. I read very, yours. Very <laughs> similar. So listen, how about a big hand? And they're going to sign the book right now. Big hand for the guys, huh? Brooklyn Reunion. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Louis, wake up. I have nothing to say. I take the fifth. That's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You're wonderful. <laughs>